Okay, let's try again. It's just the location of electrons, okay? And that's what it's all about, is we're going to be learning about the electrons that are on the outside of the nucleus in the electron cloud and how much we have learned so far about how to determine where they're at. Because we know from Bohr's planetary model in our last unit where electrons rotate around the nucleus. So like, for example, like perfectly around the nucleus, like you have all these electrons that are just perfectly going around it in this cute little orbit, like in a circle, doesn't really happen. Um, in reality, they look a lot more like our cloud model down here, where they're kind of all over the place, but they do still stay in certain energy levels. So like they are going to stay in that basic location away from the nucleus, but they're not going to stay in that perfect orbit. They're going to bounce around and they move so fast, it's actually really hard to see them. All right, so let's begin. So the quantum mechanical model is the first blank. The quantum mechanical model is the model we currently use to describe what the atom looks like. So that's our current one, newest one. Um, the quantum mechanical model of the atom was developed based on the work of an Australian an Austrian physicist named Erwin Schrodinger. In 1926, he developed a mathematical equation to describe the energy and the location of the electron. Okay, so that's what his goal was, was the energy and the location of where these electrons were at in the atom. This equation, called the Schrodinger's equation, has been extended to describe electrons in other atoms since the one he based off of um, his original like his original um, mathematical equations are based on hydrogen, they have been extended to other atoms now as well. So like I said earlier, unlike Bohr's model, which had them going around in the perfect orbits around the nucleus, we now know with Schrodinger's model that it's more of concerned with the probability, probability of finding an electron in a certain location. So it's basically, as we just know, it's a lot more complicated than the way Bohr made it look like where they flow in that perfect pattern around the nucleus. In reality, they are all moving very, very rapidly in the same energy levels, but so fast moving in a way that it's really hard to detect them. So we had to have these new mathematical equations trying to find where they were at so we could try to discover later how they bond. So the Heisenberg's uncertainty principle states that it is impossible to precisely know the location as well as the velocity, which means speed, basically. So location and the velocity of an electron. Therefore, the model is portrayed as an electron cloud because it's very hard to determine their exact location if I'm also trying to determine their speed. If I'm looking for both, I really can't find both at the same time because they move so fast. So basically, by the time I find the location of an electron, it's going to have moved. So what it looks like when we actually look at microscopes that can zoom in to the furthest levels we have today, we still cannot clearly see the protons and the neutrons of the nucleus staying exactly still and the electrons staying still. Basically, the pictures that we take of atoms look like this fuzzy wuzzy cloud. That's why it's called the electron cloud because they're moving so fast, it's almost like they're all over the place at once. Now, therefore, the model is portrayed as the electron cloud. By convention, a line is drawn for the surface of the atom at 90% probability. So basically those mathematic calculations are supposed to get us to know where the electron is, its location, 90% probable. So it's 90% sure that we're there, that it's there, but again, they do move so fast that there still is that 10% error. Right, let me scroll down. So within this cloud, there are various energy levels. Okay, so I'm right. There are various energy levels, regions around the nucleus where electrons are likely to exist. 
energy levels in an atom are summarized, and these four parts are about to go through to summarize the energy levels of an atom. So again, when I say energy level, what I mean is if I had a nucleus here, okay, so here's our nucleus, I'm talking about how far away, like literally the distance, the distance away from the nucleus. So if I have electrons that are staying this far away at energy level one, they can move all around in there, like all over the place, moving really, really fast, but they're going to stay within that energy level unless they're given extra energy that we'll talk about more when we get to life. And then we're going to have some electrons that get pushed out to this level and they can go anywhere inside this level all over these um, energy levels. I mean, all over this area in that energy level, but they're not going to move to any other level. They're not going to drop down. They're not going to drop up unless they are given more energy, which again, I said, we mentioned in life. And then you might have some electrons in this energy level. If it's a bigger atom, they might be further out. But basically, the bigger the atom is, the more protons and electrons it has, the more energy levels it's going to need to use. Because electrons cannot all take up the same place because an electron is negatively charged. So when I get an electron next to another electron that is also negatively charged, they will repel each other. So I can only have so many electrons in the same energy level, so the same distance from the nucleus, before they're going to start bumping into each other and repel each other. So I can only have a couple per energy level. We're going to break that down, how many actually fits, before they have to move further away from the nucleus. So from that, you might wonder, then why don't they just float away? Why aren't they just floating off into space? Why do they stay near the atom at all if they're repelling each other? Well, the reason being is because what is in the nucleus? So inside the nucleus, there are protons that are positively charged. So those electrons that are negatively charged are attracted to those positive protons, and that is why they stay. They're staying as close to the nucleus as they possibly can be because they're attracted to the positive protons, but they repel each other, the electron-electron, because they're both negative, so they have to spread out. So it's like they get as close as they can, but as far away from each other as they can to help to stay together in the atom. All right, so now we're going to break down these four parts of energy levels that you will need to understand and be able to use. Okay, so our first part, part one. The size and number of energy levels in an atom corresponds to the, uh, the, um, corresponds to the um, row, okay, to the period. To the period or the row. Remember, row means horizontal on the periodic table. So the period that the atom is in on the periodic table. So like for an example, if I draw a quick little periodic table here, it's probably going to be pretty terrible, but there you go. All right. So if I put my little energy levels, these numbers are on your periodic table. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. So when you look at your periodic table, copper is Cu, and it's right here. Did not a very good job lining it up. It should have lined up with four, okay? So it, it's in the row four, so it has four energy levels. Again, what that means, if I have a copper atom here, it has a nucleus, and it's going to have some electrons at energy level one. It's going to have some electrons at energy level two. It's going to have some electrons at energy level three. And it's going to have to have some electrons all the way out there at energy level four. The furthest out that electrons can get is energy level seven. They don't really get further than that because any further than that, and they really can't feel the pull of the positive protons anymore. So then they would just float off into like empty space out and around. They wouldn't be attached to their atom anymore. Okay. So now silver, silver is, let's see a little, it's right below CU. So it's right below it. So it's in row five. So it has five energy levels. So like silver, would have one more energy level. It's ha to have electrons. It's a bigger atom. Its electrons would be further away from the nucleus. And then we have radium. Radium is all the way over here in the column two, but in row seven. So it's one of our biggest atoms on the table. Not the biggest, but one of the biggest. And it has, my bad, scribbles, has seven energy levels. So it has the five. And I'd have to go all the way to a level seven being the biggest that atom could be, okay? Now we're going to scroll down to part two. All right. 
So part two tells us about not how many uh, um, energy levels an atom has, but the shape that that, inner, that that atom will take. So the electron clouds don't all look like a round ball, the way we tend to draw them. They actually come in some pretty intricate shapes. And we can see that when we to do close-up images of atoms with the, like the most precise microscopes that we have, um, they actually make these very odd shapes. So what they are, we've given them little letters to remember what they look like. So S, we're going to remember what it looks like because it's going to stand for a sphere. So if you are in a S-shaped electron cloud, the electrons are in that cloud, they do take on the circle, okay? So all their electrons are inside a circle, okay? So a circular shape or a sphere because it is 3D. And then if you're in a P shape, so a P shaped orbital or a, a P subshell, P stands for peanut. Now, not really. These are names that people have made up to help you remember what they look like. Um, so when I think of a peanut, I think of like that. Okay, so kind of like a figure eight as well. Now, in the peanut, there are actually three versions that this can turn around the center. So this one would be a Y version. There would be an X. That's a terrible peanut. Sorry. Here's a little better. And then we have the Z plane. So what I mean is if you can remember from geometry, like if I have the X and the Y plane, it's so like this peanut is literally on that X plane. This one would be up and down vertical. And the Z plane would be coming out like at you. So like more horizontal, um, taking the space around the nucleus. So in all these versions, the nucleus is in the middle. Okay, the nucleus is in the middle of those. And the electrons are anywhere inside this peanut shape, anywhere inside this peanut shape, anywhere inside this peanut shape. Okay, so they could be anywhere in there. Okay. And then we have the D shape. So for that one, I usually say that it looks like a double peanut. <laughs> I know that's silly, but it's just a way to remember it. So a double peanut meaning I draw one peanut and then I draw another one. Okay, so that means if I have that nucleus in the center, the electrons could be anywhere in here, anywhere in here, anywhere in here, or anywhere in here. All of those places are available for that electron to go in. And for the dome, I mean, for the D subshell, it actually has five versions that it could turn. So five versions, if I was imagining this in a 3D space, which will be easier when I show you pictures in a second, hopefully, um, five versions around it. I'm not going to draw all five versions because it gets really complicated to draw. But just imagine that if I took this shape and I turned it in different directions 3D wise, I could turn it five different ways. The last one, F stands for fancy for me because it is so fancy looking and complicated to draw that I don't bother. Okay, it's very hard to draw all those. And F actually has seven versions that it can turn around the nucleus. So I'm gonna scroll down just so why we're on this topic and show you the pictures of all this. So this is later on our notes, but see we have pictures right here. So the S orbital looks like a sphere and you can see that there. And then we get to the peanut orbital. Wow, I really need to erase. So erase, erase, erase. Okay. So for the peanut shell, remember I said it has three versions. So it has three ways you can turn it. And this is on the X plane. So going horizontal, Y plane up and down, and then Z plane coming out at you. All right. We scroll down and we see the D subshell and it has five versions. So you see five different versions here. Now, four of them look like that double peanut that I showed you. So it has five versions. Remember, it stands for a double peanut. So it looks like one peanut, two peanut, and four of them look like that. So they're just turning that shape different ways around the nucleus. But one of them <laughs> makes this very weird shape. And you'll see that in the S subshell as well. So it's very complicated. I don't generally draw the D subshells. I don't require y'all to draw them because they just get more complicated to draw. And then lastly, we have F, which is fancy because as you can see, it's pretty fancy. It has lots of orbitals. It takes any of those electrons could take any of these spaces around the nucleus. They could literally be anywhere in any of those seven choices. Okay. Let me scroll back up to where we left off. Yeah. 
So right here. So we can break that down a little further. It says the number of subshells or sublevels in an energy level is equal to the number of energy levels it has. Okay, so in energy level one, we already went over this. So like literally the first row on the periodic table, row number one has one subshell. They always match. So whatever row you're on, that's how many subshells it has. So the subshell to fill it is going to be just an S. It always starts with S's and then moves on to the P, D, and F shapes. So with one sublevel, it's only going to fill up an S shape. In energy level two, so when I get to row two on the periodic table, they have two subshells. And the electrons could take the S shape in a sphere or the P shape in the peanut. Energy level three has three subshells. If I'm on row three on the periodic table, they can take an S, a P, or a D shape. Energy level four, I feel like you get the point by now, has four subshells. So I could have an S, a P, a D, or an F subshell. All those shapes would be available to the electrons that that atom has. Energy level five has five subshells. So you got an S, a P, a D, an F. And then there are G's that we put this little asterisk by it because only the S, P, and D, and F subshells will actually contain electrons, but basically they have this F available shape to those very big atoms that sometimes the electrons pop into. We don't really talk about those, because so that's kind of above our level of chemistry where we're at. So energy level of six would have six subshells, so it could have an S, a P, a D, an F, a G, or an H. And again, that H is going to get an asterisk, the G is going to get an asterisk, because in reality, the electrons don't really go there unless pushed up. Okay. Now, before I go over how many electrons are actually in there, I want to show you where these things are at on the periodic table. Now, if you were actually in class, we're going to add this, these labels, to their periodic table. So if you have a periodic table, if you can print yours at home, it'd be a great idea to add this to your table. So you wouldn't have to always pull this up. So if you're looking at this periodic table here, you see our energy levels. One, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. But they're now labeled with S, P, D, and F. So right here this whole area here, all is labeled with S's. So this is always where we start and say well, with S's. So all the electrons found in this area are going to be in a sphere shape. And then what actually we hit next, because basically you just trace your finger. I'm going to go across and what I hit is still a 1S. So this is still a sphere shape. But then I go back to the beginning and I would hit a 2S, so sphere shape. And then I get to a 2P, so energy level 2 two distances away from the nucleus, and now we get to our P shape. So this entire block over here, if you find that the element is in this area, then it has P shaped orbitals. If you find an element that's down in this block, well, they're gonna have to have passed S's, they're gonna have to have passed the P shapes, and then finally have gotten to a D-shaped -shaped orbital. So they're going to have S's already, they're going to have P's already, and now they're also going to have electrons in a D-shape. If you have electrons way down here, I want to point out on your periodic table, technically these come from right here. They come from right there. So this is actually energy level 6, because it comes from right there, and energy level 7. It's just an extension. It's like a longer 6 and a longer 7. So if I find my element on this, though, this is where the F shape starts. So if you had an element here, that would mean that the electrons in that element took, in, took the shape of S's first, then P's, then they'd fill up the D shapes, and then they would start filling up the very fancy F shapes. So again, I, I realize that this sounds very complicated. The actual work that you will do with this is very simple. Um, hopefully it will make more sense tomorrow. I'm just trying to give you a little bit more background to work with, but all it means is electrons take different shapes away from the nucleus, and how far they are from the nucleus is determined based on what row they're on. So if you find an element on this row, 
that's how many energy levels away from the nucleus they are. They're four levels away. That's how they, so it's kind of telling you the size of the atom to some degree. All right, let's go back and finish what we had left. So part three, below is the number of subshells, or is it orbitals? One moment. Below is the number of orbitals. So the number of orbitals in each subshell and the orientation of these orbitals. I've basically already told you this. It's just kind of reiterating it and giving you it in note form. So the S sublevel only has one orbital. And remember, the S is a sphere. So if I'm imagining the nucleus is in the middle of that and the electrons are in that shape of a sphere, a sphere around the nucleus, there's only one way to turn a sphere around a nucleus. I can't get any other location around it. Like if I turn a ball around the center, like it's, it's still taking up the exact same amount of space. So it only has one way to turn it, only has one orbital. So there's only one shape that those electrons can be in. If the element is found in the P block of the periodic table, then the peanut shape, so remember that peanut, I can turn the peanut in three different ways and the, el the electrons would actually be taking up a different spot, a different area outside of the nucleus if I turn that shape around, unlike a sphere. So like the sphere from the S, I can't turn it in any way to actually make it take, to actually make it take up different amount of space, but the peanuts I can't. So it has three orientations. For the D subshell, it has five. For the F subshell, it has seven. So basically what you should be noticing is this is one, this is three, this is five, this is seven. So like a way to help you remember is on the periodic table that should be labeled or you have this in your notes that I'll post it, S, P, D, F, they each go up by two. So it started with one, goes up by two, goes up by two, goes up by two. And that's how many ways you could turn it. That's how many shapes it could possibly take more than the original. All right. Scrolling down to part four. So each orbital can only hold two electrons and that they must be spinning in opposite directions. Okay, so this is where I'm getting to the point of telling you, well, how do you know how many electrons can actually fit in there? And where are they all going to go in the shapes? Well, each shape I just talked about, so one sphere can hold two electrons. If I have a peanut, this peanut can hold two, but remember the peanut subshell or the P subshells have three ways I can turn it. So this one could hold two and this one could also hold two. So really the P subshell can hold six total electrons, but because the S subshell can only be turned in one way, it can only hold two electrons total before other electrons that Adam has would have to move to a higher energy level or to a different shape outside of it. So overall, what do the four parts tell us? So the first part told us the number of energy levels in an atom. And the kind of the distance away from the nucleus it would be. The second part told us the shape. So if I look at the periodic table and I have those blocked out shapes, I know from where the element is at, if it's going to have an S, a P, or a D um, shape to the electron cloud. The next one, how many, how many of those shapes? So like how many orbitals? Like this has three and this one has one. So how many orbitals or shapes will those electrons take? And then lastly, the number of electrons it can hold. All right. Now I'm going to help you. The next little section is me showing you how to do your assignment here in just a second. So you'll have similar questions to this on your assignment, and then we are done with notes. Okay, so in the sublevel S, there's only one way to turn it. Remember, there's only one way to turn a sphere around a nucleus, and for every 
orbital, every orbital can only hold two electrons. So if there's only one, then the total amount that an S subshell can hold is two electrons. And the P sublevel, it has three ways that I can turn that peanut shape around the nucleus and it take a different actual space around it. So since it has three and there's two in each one, be two, four, and six, so it can hold six electrons before we'd have to move up to a different level. The D block has five, has five ways that I can turn that double peanut shape. So if I have two, four, six, eight, ten, so two in each one, that means that it can hold ten electrons. And then lastly, the F block has seven orbitals, so seven ways I can turn that fancy shape around, and in each of those orbitals, they each can hold two each, so seven times two is 14 electrons. So that's how the breakdown goes with our sublevel and how many electrons it can hold. Okay. For energy level one, so if I'm thinking, this is thinking about the periodic table again. So if I have our little mock periodic table, and that level one, if I go across to level one, this is hydrogen and helium, all I'm going to be hitting is one sublevel. The name of that sublevel is a 1s, and if I only have one in it, then it can only hold two electrons, okay? So I'm going to show you this next one for number two. So, like, what am I going to be touching when I scroll to two? I'm going to go look at the periodic table. So, energy level two, if I'm starting here, the whole energy level two has an S shape. Remember, there's two. There's two electrons in an S shape, so it can hold two electrons. I keep going. I hit the P block, and I hit just two P. Remember, in the P block, it can hold six electrons. So if I could hold two in my S shell and two, I mean in six in my P shell, both of them being energy level two, both of them being two degrees away from the nucleus, six plus two is eight. So that's how many electrons total that it can hold in the second energy level. So in that row number two, any element that is in the second row on the periodic table cannot be more than eight electrons in the second row. So I have, let me scroll up because now I forgot what it's called. So number of sublevels, two, because that just goes with a row. It's gonna hold a one, nope, not, not a one. We crossed a 2s and a 2p. So remember there's six in p's and there's two electrons in s's. So that's eight electrons total for the second energy level. In the third energy level, there's going to be three. Okay, so there's going to be three sublevels. It always matches those numbers is how many sublevels it has. It crosses a 3s. Then it will cross a 3p. And then down below it, it eventually hits a 3D. Now, two electrons in each one. So this one holds two electrons. P has three, three orbitals. So three times two is it holds six. D has five orbitals. So five times two is 10. And then I add all those up. So 10 plus six is 16, 17, 18. So energy level three can hold 18 electrons. And the fourth energy level is gonna have four sublevels going to be a 4s and then it's going to be a 4p and then a 4d and then a 4f. All of those you can find on your periodic table labeled especially in the one that I will post in those notes that I keep showing you. So there are two electrons in s's, six total in p's, 10 total in d's, and 14 total in f. So if I add up those so that would be 24, and then I have 30, and then I have 32. So in energy level four, it can hold a total of 32 electrons. Now, if your element was below energy level four, it was like it was the very last element in row four, which is krypton, then I should be able to add up all of these that it had before. So two plus eight is 10, that'd be, 20, 28, you scroll down, so that'd be 28, 38, 48, 58, 60. So it's on number 60. Whoa. No. Okay, 
So that <laughs> is incorrect. Um, I thought you could add them up and get the same number on the current table, but nope, disregard. All right, scrolling down, and you're gonna have some of these questions on your periodic table and your assignment today as well. So hopefully this will be helpful to go over how to answer them. So put an X or sublevels below, which do not exist. So if I scroll down to my periodic table and look for 3P and 1D, which one of those does not exist? 3P and 1D. Okay, so 3P exists right there. But then does 1D exist? When I start in the D block, it already starts at an energy level 3, meaning we don't even have electrons in a double peanut shape, in a D shape until they are three levels away from the nucleus. They're not going to take that weird shape until they get at least three levels away from the nucleus. So 1D does not exist, but 3P does. So if I scroll back up to our practice, 3P exists, 1D does not. Give the number of orbitals present in the following sublevels. So for this one, the number of orbitals present is always based on the row it's in. So this is the row it's in, it's in row five. So it has five orbitals online. Um, that's just because of D. So D has five orbitals, P has three. So when we're talking about orbitals, we're talking about how many ways I can turn the shape. So remember in P, I can turn it this way, I can turn it this way, I can turn it this way. And D, I can turn it five ways. So that's just straight from your notes. Give the number of electrons present in the following sublevels. So again, S can only be turned one way. There's only one way to turn a sphere. Each time you have a new shape, it can hold two electrons each. So it can only hold two electrons. P, as I said right up there, has three ways to turn it. Two electrons in each one of those. So I would get six total, two, four, six. Electrons is how many total could be held in a 4P shell. Okay. So that is where we're going to stop. And I will post these notes so you have that periodic table to look at because I'll be having the kids in person actually label the SPD block on their notes. So if you have a periodic table, it'd be great to add that to it. But if you cannot, I will post these notes.